Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Cindy Valladares and would like to welcome to this live webcast uh, on PCI uh, DSS 3.0 advice from the QSA. This is a series of uh, webinars on PCI compliance and today we have the great pleasure to welcome Adrian Sanabria from the 451 research. So Adrian, say hello and I'll do a, a little bit of longer interview, um, I'm, I'm sorry, presentation on you after um, you had the opportunity to welcome the presenters. Uh, yes, thank you, Cindy, uh, and hello. Uh, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, I am a senior security analyst at 451 uh, Research. Lucky enough to uh, to get to write about the industry, and lucky enough to uh, to speak with uh, Cindy today about uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, PCI. Great, thank you, Adrian. And uh, Adrian was a little bit shy on his background there, so I'll expand a little bit. Um, he has been uh, doing uh, you know information security for a very long time. He was a former QSA, so he has practical advice for all of you here today. Um, he has been doing assessments for uh, different organizations, and he can give you his perspective on that. But uh, just recently, he joined the 451 Research uh, Analyst Firm as a Senior Security Analyst. And um, I've met Adrian at one of the PCI community meetings, I would say, about three or four years ago. And since then, we've carried out a really good conversation on Twitter. Um, you can see our Twitter handles there and uh, more than impressed with his level of expertise on the PCI compliance area, but most importantly, security in general. Um, he's, uh, you know, I, I also noted that he's also a volunteer at the National Board of Information Security Examiners, so um, we have a relationship with that organization as well, and if you're not aware of them, check them out, because they're a great organization that can support the skills of the information security community. Um, Adrian has also written various posts on PCI DSS 3.0, and you can check them out at the site on 451. And I think we've also gotten some of your comments and feedback on our blog at tripwire.com slash blog. So before we get started and kick it off, just a couple of housekeeping items for everyone on the phone and on the webcast today. You will get a copy of the slides. That's usually one of the questions that I always get. Um, we will have opportunity for have questions and answers towards the end of the presentation, so please type them in as you have them, and we'll try to get to as many as possible as we can. And the other one, if, it's, if you're a social person on Twitter, uh, join us in the conversation typing uh, the hashtag PCI webcast, and I will do my best to multitask, uh, be here at the presentation screen with you, as well as monitor the, the Twitter chatter. So uh, please um, uh, share your thoughts, comments, and insights uh, as the presentation goes along. So today we're going to talk about the PCI uh, DSS 3.0 and especially on the QSA point of view. Many of you are probably preparing for this new um, uh, version and would like to know, you know, what, what would the QSA look like, uh, in, look for in your uh, assessment and will it change your report on compliance at all? And, and the other topic that we thought would be good to share with you is what makes a good QSA? What kind of criteria or traits do you look for on a QSA? And we will also wrap it up with a couple of resources to make your audit process much easier uh, for both you and your QSA. So with that in mind, um, Adrian, why don't you lead us to the QSA point of view? Why do you think it's uh, important for us to consider um, how this version of 3.0 will affect the QSA? And I know you've been to some of the community meetings, have been on top of uh, this latest version, and would love to get your input in terms of what's most important about this version and how could it affect both positively and potentially challenging ways organizations. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so Cindy, I think that um, you know it's important to have a good relationship with your QSA. Uh, I've seen a lot of organizations have an adversarial 
a relationship with uh, QSAs and, and auditors in, in general. And not only can the audit go more smoothly, I, I think, with a, with a good QSA, but a good QSA with a security background uh, can also help, um, you know, turn PCI into more of a, uh, um, you know, help it uh, uh, be the best benefit for security in, in addition to just PCI. So, yeah, the relationship is uh, is very important. I've seen a lot of people um, uh, just stick with their QSA because, uh, you know, the same firm also does other things for them, you know, and so the QSA kind of gets, uh, and the PCI assessment gets tagged on uh, because they're using, uh, you know, one of the one of the big analyst firms, um, you know, or it's built into the contract or something like that. But, you know, I, I'd urge people, really, if it's if it's not working, uh, you know, uh, consider getting a Q QSA from somewhere else or ask for a different QSA from that same firm. So um, <clears throat> here in this slide, uh, I'm making the point that uh, you don't actually have to use the, the QSA for, for everything. There are even uh, firms out there that do PCI consulting uh, and uh, don't fill out the ROC. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's um, important to consider your options. Uh, QSA is not the only place you can get PCI advice from, though, of course, you, you probably want to run any major decisions uh, by your QSA to get a feel for, for whether or not uh, uh, they will sign off on it and, and they're okay with it. You know, so it should really be, uh, you know, a lot of places uh, bring in the QSA once a year uh, to do the audit, and, you know, it, it should really be more of an ongoing conversation. You know, if you can, talk to your QSA monthly or, you know, at least quarterly uh, to keep tabs on, uh, uh, keep them updated on what you're doing, make sure you're not going down the, the wrong path, and, uh, uh, you know, make sure you keep uh, PCI fresh in your mind. <clears throat> So one of the issues uh, with PCI and QSAs um, is that it does introduce some conflicts of, of interest, whether real or, or perceived. You know, I, I think they're definitely um, uh, real issues, you know, that, that are still, a lot of them are allowed at the moment. Uh, one of the big ones is uh, the same company uh, that you hire your QSA from uh, can also sell you services. And uh, most of the time, this is okay. You know, you know, if you have a QSA you trust, um, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with uh, taking their recommendations and buying services. You know, but th there's certainly the potential for abuse here. You know, where a QSA could, uh, you know, in subtler terms, tell you, you, you know, you, if you want to be compliant, you have to buy this. So that's definitely an issue, and, uh, you know, just the fact that you're paying the person that uh, is responsible for saying you're compliant, you know, kind of in the other direction. As a QSA, you know, it, it's a very tricky relationship uh, to balance, uh, to be the guy responsible for um, being uh, fair and uh, unbiased, uh, while at the same time uh, you're being paid to do so. So how would you suggest uh, people would approach that, uh, Adrian, in terms of that, um, keeping that on, on bias? And perhaps you've been in those situations where you can tell us some, some stories from the field. Sure. So, so personally, uh, I've found uh, a lot of people actually prefer uh, the PCI QSA to make recommendations because that makes things easier. Uh, the, the decision is easier for them, you know, if the QSA says, you know, that this product here, this solution is, is compliant, use this. You know, it, it takes, uh, you know, some extra guesswork out of it, um, less work for them having to run around and, and do different uh, proof of concepts and trying out different products. Um, you know, but, but typically, um, you know, when I did work as a QSA, I worked for a company that also sold products. You know, but I would always make it clear to them, uh, you know, what, what their full range of options were. Uh, so from the other side of it, um, definitely always be aware that your options are open. 
that you don't have to take the choice that that your QSA presents to you if if they're doing that, and and that you do uh, you do have options. Great, thank you. Um, before we go on to the next section, I would like to ask uh, the audience whether they are um, satisfied with your current QSA. Um, and, you know, there, there is a wide range, I think you mentioned this a little bit later, but there's a wide range of, um, you know, of QSA services from very hands-on uh, people that, you know, you, you may see very often and help you in the security part of your, um, of your assessments and some QSAs that focus more on, you know, just clicking the checklist. So I'd be curious to see if you haven't voted, if you can give us a sense of, uh, you know, how satisfied are you with your current QSA. What, what do you think the, the votes are going to come in, um, Adrian? You know, I, I'm kind of curious because, uh, you know, when I was a QSA in my four years um, a, as a QSA, I was constantly uh, surprised with the different range of uh, of QSAs and, and really how they approached uh, doing the assessment uh, because it, it was just night and day from how I did it. You know, I, I worked at a small firm, you know, so it was very – we were very focused on the customer. Uh, we usually did do other services for customers like the uh, penetration test. Um, so it was, you know, we would tend to spend a lot more time with the customer, I think, than, than some of the, um, you know, other firms that I ran into that were just kind of in and out with it. You know, it was a very uh, quick, brief thing. They come in once a year and do it, whereas I, I kind of pushed for us to also sell some extra consulting hours so we could have those conversations throughout the year, not, not just during the audit. Yeah, and you know, it's surprising. I stopped the voting and we have about 45% of people that says that they're, they're very satisfied with them. Uh, about 15% that said no, but more surprisingly to me, uh, you know, 40% almost say that they don't have one. So for those of you who fall into that bucket, we'll go over some of the criteria later on that can help you find um, a good uh, QSA for, for you. Uh, but before we get into there, why don't we talk about what the impact does the PCI DSS 3.0 have on the report of com on compliance? So I'll let you take over again, Adrian, and um, you know talk about whether it could potentially be more expensive and uh, our favorite answer of it depends. <laughs> right. Yeah. So th this is. Um a source of a lot of frustration, uh, you know, for people trying to get answers about PCI. Uh, and, and maybe some of you have experienced this, but uh, a, a very con common answer um, to almost any PCI question uh, you would ask is it depends. And part of the reason for that is actually a good thing about PCI. Uh, PCI is uh, often described as very prescriptive, uh, but when you really uh, dive behind the intent on some of the items. You know, at a, at a high level, it does look prescriptive, but as far as how you solve uh, these problems and how you meet these requirements, it, it's actually quite flexible, which is why you keep hearing it depends. Uh, and so with, with PCI 3.0, with the changes that are coming, uh, again, it really depends on how your QSA interprets the new changes as to whether you're going to have to spend more money or, you know, you're going to have to make changes, uh, you know, get, get some new solutions uh, for things. <clears throat> you know, like one of them uh, is, a, is a slight change to antivirus, for example. Um, you know, it says you, you really need to take a closer look at what uh, systems are affected by, by malware. And really, depending on your QSA's point of view, your QSA could take a black and white point of view and say, is there a piece of malware in existence for this platform? If yes, you have to have antivirus. Or, you know, your QSA could take, uh, for example, uh, a more holistic view and say, is it, is, is there a reasonable um, <clears throat> expectation that this system would ever get uh, infected with malware? And if the answer is no, uh, you know, they, they might say that, that you don't have to put antivirus on those systems. And obviously the, uh, 
the big one there are, are Linux systems and, and Linux servers. Uh, typically, that, that makes up the bulk of the systems uh, without antivirus in, in most PCI environments, and especially Adrian, when you use the cloud, which is almost entirely Linux. So I couldn't resist uh, jumping in when you're mentioning right now um, antivirus, because one of the things that we found out from from the target breach is that, um, uh, you know, they tested over 40 uh, anti-malware, uh, uh, you know, tests and, and solutions, and none of them could find this variation of the black POS uh, virus. So, you know, it, it goes beyond just what solutions you have, but what is the purpose of the requirement? You know, is it really trying to keep you secure? And it might not be that exact solution, but ways to keep you protected in any ways. Right, and, and that, that kind of gets into a, a bigger issue with PCI, which, which uh, you know, comes to the, the perspective of it. You know, having antivirus, you know, I don't think anyone expects it, you know, to catch everything. And, you know, certainly the, um, uh, the figures we've seen coming out of uh, uh, third-party uh, uh, tests or, or that uh, antivirus is, uh, it, it varies a lot. I've seen anything from antivirus being 20% effective all the way up to, 60% effective, and then you know, coming from the vendors, all the way up to 95 and 100% uh, effective. You know, so it, it's uh, you know, and it, it doesn't really matter because the uh, the bad guys have the ability uh, through tools like uh, Virus Total, you know, and other you know, they could even make their own homegrown one, and they make sure the the malware isn't going to get caught before they use it. You know, so you you really have to have um, you know that that kind of gets into the PCI not being a um, a security program. You know, it, it is a compliance baseline, and if you think that you know just doing everything in PCI uh, is going to enable you to stop that malware, you know, then you, know, you you probably need to do a little bit more. So uh, another point from the previous slide, uh, yeah, point out that. Um, <clears throat> The QSA's interpretation is really all of PCI. Uh, that's really the heart of it. You know, PCI is what that QSA thinks it is. Um, and there are probably as many interpretations of PCI as there are QSAs. Now, the uh, PCI Council has done some things to try and cut down on that. They have the Quality Assurance Program, um, <clears throat> and they have the, the annual meetings, and you're required to to go read all the frequently asked questions on the, if you're a QSA, you're actually required to go out to the PCI Council website and read all those so that as much as possible they, they try and ensure everyone's on the same page. They have a monthly newsletter that addresses some of the, the most commonly misinterpreted uh, requirements. But despite all that, you're still going to have QSAs uh, that, that aren't all on the same page. So some additional impact of PCI 3.0. Uh, service providers uh, now have to, we, <clears throat> they're calling for some clarity on who's responsible for what. Uh, whether it's a uh, cloud provider providing almost everything for you or uh, co-location or hosting company providing, you know, everything in between from just rack space to maybe server administration and user administration, uh, you're now required to have something that clearly states who's responsible for which pieces of PCI. So I, I, I think that's important to, uh, uh, you know, I think part of the issue there is, uh, you know, there's some finger pointing going on, people saying, well, no, my hosting provider is PCI compliant. I don't have to do anything with these systems. So we, we definitely want to know where the line is drawn. Also. Um, for the PCI penetration test, which is only required once a year, um, it now has to include testing the segregation uh, between the credit card environment and the rest of the enterprise. And I, I think that's pretty big. If that's used correctly uh, in a good quality penetration test, um, I, I think it's one of the biggest issues right now. Uh, and it, 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 uh, there's a good chance that it played a big role in the target breach. Uh, the details I saw is that uh, the attackers got in through a website 
which is almost certainly not part of the um, the uh, same credit card environment that the uh, – well, I, I would hope a web server wouldn't be on the same network segment as the uh, the actual POS machines. You know, so obviously, you know, there, there's a good chance, very good chance, that the attackers were – uh, crossing these segmentation boundaries. And uh, one of the issues with, with PCI is people get very focused on just the systems that are in scope uh, when that segmentation uh, method is, uh, you know, all kinds of problems uh, you could have there and, and holes and ways for attackers to get, uh, you know, crossed from non-PCI systems to PCI systems. So segmentation for the penetration uh, test is uh, it's now required to, to test the segmentation method. Uh, and it's also required for penetration, uh, the penetration test to have a methodology attached. Now, it doesn't really get into details of what that methodology has to be. You know, again, there's some flexibility here, but there's also a good chance uh, for bad interpretations. Uh, but I think the intent here is to try and get the industry away from accepting uh, vulnerability scans as a penetration test, which which they're, they're, they're I think everyone would agree that they're not. <clears throat> Great points that you make there, um, and there's a there's a couple actually on this uh, specific point on the pen testing. Um, we cover that topic on the first um, the first webcast on this series, and we'll make sure you get a copy of that and a follow up email because I have a couple of people asking for that already. Um, so you'll get a better understanding on the pest test, ten, pen testing requirements and how that will impact your your job as well. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention is um, here at Tripwire, we've done several uh, post articles on uh, tripwire.com slash blog that covers um, some of the aspects of the target breach. So if you haven't... Um, taking a look at some of those articles that, you know, you, you may uh, find them valuable as you do your research on how to, if, especially if you're in retail and have uh, POS devices and how to you know, prevent that from happening. So um, I'll try to interrupt less Adrian and, uh, you know, want to make sure that I get to the people's questions. But can you talk to us about, um, you know, what does the QSA job um, comprise of? You know, it's... Uh, it's certainly, I have a lot of friends that say I'm a recovering QSA, so that lent, lets me to believe that it's, uh, it's uh, you know, not very appreciated and a lot of hard work. So uh, talk to us about some of the details there on understanding the job of the QSA. Right. So, you know, one, one of the first things to address there is, is that it, it is a very crowded market. Uh, there's over 300 QSA companies. Uh, currently listed on the PCI Council's website. Uh, you can go there. You can get a list of the uh, QSA companies, and you, you can even look up uh, individually uh, certified uh, QSAs on there. And, uh, you know, 300 might not sound like a lot, you know, but, uh, you know, a few of those are very big, and I, I think a lot of them are, are probably on the smaller side. Uh, and a lot of them provide a wide range of uh, auditing services, you know, so you've, you've got a wide range of uh, different companies offering QSA services. <clears throat> and oftentimes when they're bundled with other services and maybe even products, uh, you know, costs can vary wildly. I, I've seen um, anywhere from, from very low uh, five digits, may, maybe even into the uh, four digits uh, for uh, – an assessment all the way well into uh, six digit numbers for a single annual PCI assessment. Uh, obviously, you know, some of the, the earlier, you know, if it's your very first time and you have a large PCI environment uh, and you have a lot of off site hosting, maybe several different data centers, um, large retail network, uh, you know, the price is going to be higher. Um, but the point here is is that uh, there's a lot of competition that tends to drive price down and tends to drive companies to uh, want their QSAs to uh, to do more. You know, so there's uh, uh, the market gets uh, very saturated and uh, or has been very saturated for for a while um, <clears throat> in the typical QSA uh, can can be uh, under a lot of pressure to 
do more assessments and to do them faster. <clears throat> so it, it's uh, you know, from my own personal background and almost every QSA I've ever talked to, uh, it, it is a rough job. You know, when I used to travel around doing this, you know, it's the kind of job where uh, you go on site for as little time as possible to do the assessment. Uh, and if there is any time left over at the airport or in your hotel room, uh, you're, you're still working on PCI. You know, whether it's working on the rock, organizing uh, your interview notes from the day, or, uh, you know, sending off emails asking for more evidence, um, you know, there's always something else you can do. There's always extra work. <clears throat> So, you know, a typical QSA job, you know, if you maybe have, uh, you know, a few stores to, to go and audit and, uh, you know, in the headquarters or wherever the data center is uh, that the, the main cardholder environment's at, you know, you, you might be looking at anywhere from, from 20 to 80 hours uh, in a job. And uh, the average really good QSA that I've seen um, really uh, knows your network pretty well. Uh, just uh, 5, 10, even uh, a as much as uh, 20 hours in. So it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, th there's some high expectations there. Uh, you really have to know where the credit card information uh, comes in, all the locations it comes in to the environment, uh, where it goes, where it gets stored, where it's just in memory, um, what it touches, if it's encrypted or not. <clears throat> as a QSA, uh, you, you really... To do the job right, you really have to know all that information. And as of PCI 2.0, uh, that is a uh, uh, one of the – it's not an actual numbered requirement, uh, but you're actually required to check the environment every year and make sure that credit card numbers aren't showing up or aren't stored outside of the uh, defined scope. <clears throat> So let's see. Um, you know, I, I think the high level, the, the simple view of it, you know, is, is that you, you come in, uh, you get the high level of the env environment, you do some interviews, uh, you know, you assess it and write, write the rock, you know, but there's a lot that goes on behind uh, the scenes. I originally had some screenshots in here uh, of the, the quality assurance spreadsheet uh, that's kind of universally used by QSAs to, to grade the rocks. Uh, and if you add up all the points, I think there's almost a 1,000 points uh, that can be awarded. And anything less than 75% um, or, you know, around 750 points uh, uh, would fail the rock, you know, and you have to go back and, and find more evidence or, um, you know, even redo uh, some of the assessment. <clears throat> So I tried to include screenshots of that, but to actually get the spreadsheet to fit, you know, there's so much information on it, um, it, it would have been unreadable. Just to, to give you an idea of, of what a daunting task this is. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of people call it checkbox compliance, uh, but for each requirement, um, I'm not going to read this whole slide here, just uh, touching on a few points, uh, you know, it might be you know, a full page of notes uh, just for a single requirement describing what you did, what the customer is doing to satisfy this requirement, what the environment looks like, what operating systems are involved, whether or not you uh, sampled 10 out of 500 servers, you know, or you looked at every single server, um, just to give some examples. You know, it, it's uh, – uh, there is no checkbox. You know, you're, you're writing sometimes volumes of information uh, for a single requirement uh, describing how you know that it is uh, or was not compliant. And to top all that off, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of firms, it, it does make sense, you know, to, to work multiple assessments so that, you know, you're not sitting on your, your hands for weeks on end while you're waiting for the customer to uh, remediate issues that you found. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times, you know, sometimes that can get out of control and a QSA can have uh, three, five, you know, even uh, I've heard of cases of QSAs juggling uh, ten or more assessments at a time. You know, and <laughs> if, if you run into a situation like I have 
where you've got four or five deadlines all around, maybe even in the, the same week, um, you know, that, that can get really rough. And uh, to hit on what uh, Cindy was talking about originally, um, <clears throat> I've not talked to many QSAs. Certainly on the average, uh, two years is a long time to do this job. Uh, because it, you know, it is very intense, high expectations, not a lot of downtime, and it's uh, uh, very involved uh, work. You know, certainly the rock is, is a big piece of that. Putting together a rock, putting together, you know, in some cases thousands of individual pieces of, of evidence for a single assessment. Um, <clears throat> it, it's it's. Uh, Definitely something that makes you think about uh, an alternative way to make a living after a couple years. So on this slide, this is an example. You know, I was talking about nearly a thousand points. Um, these are some of the different types of evidence you might have to provide. Uh, you know, so for example, if something's supposed to be encrypted uh, when it's sent in transit, uh, in, in a lot of occasions you're, you're expected to actually obtain a packet capture of that, however you do that. Um, you know, if you're using their help to do it, if you're using a passive LAN tab, you know, however you do it, uh, you need some way of verifying that it actually is encrypted. And in my experience as a QSA, um, and, you know, others who have worked in, in similar um, assessments and situations, um, I find about it's about 50-50 when people say, oh, yeah, that's supposed to be encrypted, or no, there's not any credit card data there. It's about 50-50 as to whether uh, that's correct or not, whether that's because, you know, not to say that they're lying, but, in, you know, in a lot of cases somebody told them that it was or it used to be and something happened, but uh, the QSA is really required to lay eyes on it, you know, to make sure that it is what the customer claims, you know the whole trust but verify thing. Okay, great. Um, so that, that was really good um, perspective from the QSA job. And I would be curious to see, and I would like to, let me just um, do the voting here. I would like to ask people in terms of, you know, you've seen some of the changes on PCI 3.0 and some of the perspective from Adrian here in terms of, um, you know, the job of a QSA and probably a couple of things that they will be finding, um, you know, more uh, or focusing more as we roll 3.0. So when you are, when are you preparing for PCI 3.0? Could the audience please take a minute to vote whether they're taking immediate action on that or whether they're waiting up until the, the last minute. And while we wait for some of those results to come in, Adrian, I wanted to ask um, a quick question from you in terms of, as you read the 3.0, are there any specific um, requirements that the QSA will focus uh, more on or affect their, um, their assessment more than others? We've already talked about the pen testing. Is there something um, else that you can tell us in that regard? Yeah, the, the, there are several. Um, one of the things about 3.0 is that a lot more clarification in general is, is required across the board. So, you know, I've been talking about all this evidence the QSA has to uh, collect, and uh, that, that's, that's more a uh, – <clears throat> That's more the case than ever with 3.0, you know, so I, I really would not be surprised to see the price of uh, PCI assessments going up, you know, maybe even considerably, um, because if you go through, the uh, the PCI Council actually has a list of all the changes from 2.0 to 3.0 on there, and the vast majority of them, I, I don't know what percentage, um, but the vast majority of them are clarifications and uh, requests for the QSA to actually gather uh, more evidence and uh, ensure that they are determining uh, without a doubt that the, uh, or with less of a doubt, uh, that the uh, um, that the service provider or the, the merchant is uh, complying with these requirements. Okay, great, thank you. So if we look at the results of the voting, um, I think most people are either doing it now or at 
at least planning to to finalize it before the end of 2014. So there's uh, very yeah. It looks like 82% uh, that... are being proactive. Yeah, that's this is great news actually. Um, so you know, I do want to make sure that we leave um, enough room towards the end to ask for some of the questions. But um, our our next section here is talk about how do we find a good QSA, and we actually did have some questions about can you provide some details on that. So I'll let you cover that in the next couple of minutes, Adrian, and then um, would like to wrap it up. Uh, you know, providing some resources and and moving into the questions. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, to touch, uh, before I dive into this real quick on, on your last question, uh, one thing I'm, I'm very curious about, uh, you know, one of the requirements that came out of uh, the uh, Hancock Fabrics uh, breach, and uh, I forget what the other one was, maybe uh, Michael's, uh, where people are actually physically swapping out um, good credit card terminals with uh, uh, tampered. Uh, credit card terminals, you know, so one of the new requirements is to physically secure terminals, and it doesn't really go into a lot of detail, so that's that's one of those where I'm I'm kind of curious as to how people are handling that in, in retail environments and, and how that's being interpreted by QSAs. Uh, you know, personally, I know that that's something I would have to have to spend a good long time thinking about in different environments, you know, as as far as what would be compliant and what would not. <clears throat> so finding a good QSA uh, is, is one of my favorite topics, especially having worked as one. Uh, you know, I came out of an enterprise environment where, you know, we were doing PCI and we had always had the same kinds of QSAs, the kinds that came in uh, once a year, and uh, I, I like to call it uh, PCI panic mode that the business goes into that one month a year when the auditor comes in and nobody's been doing their PCI tasks or they've been doing very little or the bare minimum <clears throat> and everybody's scrambling to uh, update all their documentation, uh, get their firewall audits done, you know, and after working as a QSA, I realized that a lot of that's not necessary, you know, and that, that there are more ways to do PCI than to just go into panic mode one month a year. So one of the things I learned becoming a QSA is, is that PCI is really not as black and white as uh, some QSAs and, and uh, uh, some companies might have you think. You know, there, there really is a lot of room for interpretation and a good QSA um, <clears throat> can maybe find you some cost saving solutions, you know, some things that, uh, you know, where, where the obvious solution uh, maybe isn't, isn't your only option. So, you know, shopping for a QSA, the big thing is, is to interview them. You know, find a QSA you're comfortable with, uh, one that seems to understand your business. You know, make sure to ask them uh, a lot of questions. Um, one thing I wish I had done uh, uh, in preparation for this webcast is uh, I think somewhere I've, I've actually seen some recommended uh, questions. But definitely go out there, uh, do some Google searches maybe after this uh, webcast. Uh, I can go out there and try and find some, but I, I believe I have seen some recommended uh, interview questions for your QSA. <clears throat> and, um, you know, definitely, I, I've mentioned this before, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit here, but uh, look for more of a relationship than the guy that comes in uh, that one week a year or that one month a year and sends the entire business into panic mode, you know, having, Set it up so that you have some extra consulting time. Uh, you can discuss your PCI issues, your concerns uh, throughout the year, you know, and, and also try and spread out your QSA, or not your QSA, your PCI tasks throughout the year also. You know, don't wait for that one time a year. You know, if you spread everything out, uh, I truly believe, and, and I've done this uh, for a lot of my clients back in the day, you know, I've really tried to uh, make it a lot less of an emergency you know, that once a year emergency and spread out uh, the different PCI tasks uh, as much as possible, scheduling them throughout the year. <clears throat> I also recommend uh, sticking with one QSA uh, if that works. You know, again, originally I, I thought it would be a great idea to change your QSA every year, you know, so that you have fresh eyes uh, to maybe 
find things that the other QSA mixed. Um, but you've got to balance that with the <clears throat> the obvious benefit of a QSA that understands your environment. You can call them right up. You don't have to explain everything. You don't have to catch them up on what your environment looks li like, um, you know, what operating systems you're running, all those tiny, tiny details that matter when making a decision. You know, when you've got someone that knows your environment, you know, it it's very nice to just give them a call, have a, you know, 10, 15-minute conversation, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, you know, and they know your environment, they can give you an answer right away. Also, I recommend uh, checking out, uh, uh, there's a PDF, a paper out there that Brandon Williams uh, has done. He's been very involved in PCI, and if, if you're not familiar with his blog, it's a, it's a good blog to look up. Um, and his Seven Sins of the QSAs is, is a, uh, a great, great paper to read before uh, you hire a QSA or if you're not happy with your QSA and you're about to go out shopping again. <clears throat> again, um, kind of reiterating again here, a good QSA can tell you the difference uh, between what's required for compliance uh, versus, and, and th this is one of Brandon Williams' sins of a QSA, is uh, making up requirements or increasing requirements you know, as the security part um, of that QSA makes them say, well, really, this should be this. You know, it, it's uh, a good QSA should be able to tell you what the letter of the law is, um, but also say, hey, you know, you, you might want to, if you wanted to do more than this, um, here, here's some uh, suggestions there also. A good QSA can give you options. And ultimately, a good QSA should understand your business. You know, I think that goes without saying. Um, you know, I've got a, I've got many, many anecdotes uh, from when I was a QSA. You know, and, and several of them uh, revolve around times that the company I was working for uh, was uh, brought in to replace an existing QSA. And one of the most common issues I found was QSAs were QSAs that did not understand the business environment, you know, and, and they were trying to take a very black and white view of a requirement or many requirements or the entire PCI standard and apply that in a way that, that didn't work for that business or didn't make sense. Over to you, Cindy. Great, thank you, Adrian. Uh, before I, um, I just have a couple of slides before I go in there, but I wanted to remind people to please uh, send in your questions if you haven't already. And uh, another request that I have for you is if you can click on the ratings button and let us know how we're doing. You know, we have stars from one to five, I believe. It really helps us improve these webcasts. So take a moment um, to do that while you can, if you could, please. Um, so, you know, Tripwire addresses 11 of the 12 PCI DSS requirements, all except requirement 9, which is the restricting the physical access to cardholder data. Um, at some point in time, we were actually written in the first spec of the PCI DSS. So we know PCI um, since the beginning and know it very well. What you may not know um, is that we have a wide variety of uh, solutions to help you with that. You might know us from the file integrity monitoring or security configuration management, but we also have vulnerability management with the acquisition of NCircle um, and how can help you with those um, scans um, that you are required to do, and log intelligence, so, you know, all the log management requirements that are available in the DSS we can help you with. Um, we also have a lot of reporting out of the box to help in your assessment and audit. So we've worked with many QSAs in the past, uh, really trying to understand what they're looking for and build those out of the box so that you, when you move from installing our software to deploying it to actually putting them in the systems that where your credit card data is, you can easily uh, report on that and hand over the report over to your QSA. We have some examples on that on the website, so just browse around. We'll be happy to um, give you those discussions. So there are a couple of um, resources that are um, that could be 
uh, found useful for you. The first one, taking that um, uh, PDF that uh, Adrian was mentioning before where the council, the council on PCI has developed the changes from 2.0 to 3.0, we created an infographic. I'm a, a visual person. I like to see things um, in a visual format better than long PDFs. So we created that infographic, and it said the link on your site, um, on, your, um, on, on the slide, and you'll get a copy of this. Also, a link to the council website. I know there was a person looking for the URL on the council. It's PCISecuritystandards.org. So the DSS is out there, and you can look at that. Uh, this webcast series, if you go to our website and register for the second one, where we'll be covering um, creating a culture of business as usual, more into the security side of things. If you're interested in more risk-based uh, security management, um, there's some resources there as well. The one resource that I don't have here is um, the seven sins, uh, the seven uh, deadly sins of the QSA that Brandon Williams created. But I just right now did a quick Google search on it, and if you type that in, you'll get the resource. And Brandon's a good friend of both. Adrian and I has great resources on his site uh, and his blog. So feel free to look at those as well. Yeah, definitely okay. an excellent blog to follow. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Brandon has contributed a lot of his thoughts on our blog as well. So, But, uh, yeah, that's a person that you should know. He's written a book as well on PCI. I think it's second edition out right now. So somebody you um, you should probably get to know. Um, the, the third webcast on the series will happen on March uh, 2014, and you are already registered to that uh, because of your attendance today. We'll send a link as we get closer. So I'm going to take some, I'm going to leave this slide up on the uh, key PCI resources, and I will take some of um, the questions. Um, uh, let's say um, the first one, Adrian, is when they're looking for a QSA, what types of credentials should they have? Do they need to be certified, accredited, and not only from a QSA perspective, but you know, CISP or any other um, credentials that you would recommend? You know, I, I really think uh, you know, doing the interview is is the better uh, indication of of how well they know uh, security, and 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 really having. And, and, and the reason I say that is, is because understanding your business is also, uh, I think, as important as being uh, experienced in security. <clears throat> and I've definitely run into many QSAs that, uh, um, personally, I, I didn't feel had the necessary security background, um, you know, to, to really um, do the job justice. But um, um, you know, credentials. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys who's kind of on the fence of, about how useful. Uh, those are, you know, so I definitely think uh, you'd get a better feel uh, just talking to them and having some very specific and pointed questions. And definitely if, if I were a, a retail environment, I would want, uh, you know, someone with experience in that area, you know, either from the IT side or from uh, previous uh, PCI assessments, you know, because some, some of these areas uh, where QSAs are working uh, are very specific, you know, and, and they uh, – some of them, like retail, um, are very far from your normal IT environment. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, when you were talking about all of the requirements, you, you also mentioned that sometimes those mini-narratives um, that goes along each of the requirements to say how they're compliant, would you recommend that those mini-narratives are actually written up? And is that a, a more of a recommendation or a necessary requirement before an organization can consider themselves to be PCI compliant? No, I'm not sure what the, <clears throat> the mini-narratives uh, refer to here, Cindy. Do you, do you have any insight into that? I'm thinking it refers back to your comment on, um, you know, when you're doing the requirements, it's not just a simple checkbox. You know, you, you would have to, All right. you know, provide a little bit more of, a, of detail on, on why yes or why not. 
Right. Well, if, if that's what they're talking about, um, that, that's not something that the, the company has to do. That, that's actually something that the QSA has to do on the rock. Um, so if you've never uh, – I think pretty much all organizations have to sign the rock. Um, you know, so you should have an opportunity to, to take a look at that. Uh, if not, uh, I think a lot of QSA companies out there will actually provide a uh, sanitized uh, anonymous rock for you. Uh, for you to, to get a feel for, for what us QSAs are actually writing in those boxes. Um, but yeah, that, that is a requirement. You're not allowed to just, uh, yep, this is, this is compliant, this is good, thumbs up. Uh, which, uh, in the early days, people did. You know, people would actually take their company logo and they'd pop it in that compliance box and that, that was it. You know, it was just a little picture. So, Adrian, let me ask you a question here. What happens, or what do, how does the process look like if you disagree with your QSA's findings or if your assessment, or you strongly disagree? There might be areas where they're gray and you can come up with an agreement, but if you strongly right. disagree, what's the process there? So one of the things I'd suggest is, uh, you know, especially if you have a, you know, PCI is pretty big for your company, you know, if you're, a credit card processor, large retail, you know, ha have someone else you can ask that's maybe from a different company or, um, you know, get a second opinion from somewhere, uh, regardless of where you're going. Um, you know, that PCI's uh, opinion is, is not the end-all, be-all. Uh, so get a second opinion. Uh, you can even ask your QSA company for a different QSA if you're finding that's an issue on uh, a lot of the requirements, you know, or, you know, in extreme cases, uh, I've seen a lot of companies actually uh, fire their QSA and, and, and go to a different one. But you, you definitely have a lot of options there. I, I think the big issue comes from the fact that um, PCI is time sensitive. And you do have a deadline. And, you know, eventually um, fines uh, can become an issue. You know, but it, generally they'll work with you. You know, if you're having an issue with the QSA, I wouldn't worry too much about the deadline, you know, as long as you uh, work with your acquirer and they can see that you're, you're working out an issue. Um, you know, I, I think it's more important to, uh, you know, resolve the issue with that requirement. So this, this may be a time where it becomes important to, for your foes be, to become your friends, you know, talking with some of your comp competitors being in the same industry and finding out what, you know, what, uh, what their QSAs do for them as well. Yeah, I, I, and I wish, you know, and, and for solutions for PCI uh, issues also, like, you know, I, I bring up retail a lot because uh, I, I did a lot of retail when I was a QSA, and I wish retail companies, I wish there was more uh, of a venue for them to, to share solutions, you know, because they, they all had the same problems, and, uh, you know, ostensibly it would be me. You know, I, I would be their connection. You know, they'd ask me, well, w what are other retail companies doing? And you should be able to ask your uh, a good experienced QSA uh, should be able to tell you, oh, this company did something really clever. You know, they, instead of buying this product, you know, they actually did this, you know, and they saved themselves a, a lot of money and they're both secure and compliant. You know, a, a good QSA should be able to uh, uh, to do that for you. You you bring a really great um, point here, and I was just having a discussion yesterday with some of my colleagues here, but, you know, in financial services and the energy space, there are some um, really good ISEX information sharing centers, but we couldn't think of a good place for retail to do that. So um, it, uh, we have time for one more question, and this is a little bit loaded, if, if you will, Adrian, but, um, <laughs> you know, version 3.0, uh, was aimed to be a, an evolution, not a revolution of the standard. It aimed to provide a lot of clarity in some of the guidance, as you discussed earlier. Um, many argue that that goal has not been achieved, that it could create more confusion than guidance. So what is your take on that? Um, you know, did it actually achieve that goal, or does it provide more confusion for people? Um, right. Well, I, you know, I, I think... Um, some of it did provide uh, more clarity, um, but, uh, y you know, like I was saying earlier with the, uh, you know, physically protect your your uh, credit card terminal, you know, I mean, that, that is so wide open that, um, 
Yeah, I think part of the problem is looking to to the council uh, to solve a lot of these issues. And, you know, it, it took me uh, a few years of sending questions to the council. Um, I was at QSA for four years uh, to realize that, you know, they really wanted you to interpret most of this. They wanted you to be a security professional and say, okay, you know, here's the general requirement, here's the intent of it, um, and, you know, <laughs> make sure these people aren't going to get breached, you know, per per that requirement. You know, so a lot of that falls on the QSA. And it's easy to look at the requirements and say, ah, oh, there's a gap here, there's something missing here, or, you know, this isn't clear, you know, and, and that just makes a good QSA all that more important. Because they, they, good QSA can fill in those gaps. Great, excellent point, and I think a great summary of your presentation, right? Don't overlook the criteria and the qualifications of your QSA and work with them um, uh, with a great partnership to get to the security you need um, and, of course, be compliant with PCI. So with that, um, I would like to thank Adrian for your time today. Great insights. I really appreciate that you were able to join us today. And of course, to all of you in the, on the phone and on the webcast, uh, thank you for your time and allowing us to be part of your day. Um, we'll follow up with some more information, uh, more resources. Uh, thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.